Tenokoto, Kia ora tato. Welcome to everyone attending this session. Thank you very much, um, Kelly from Auckland Museum. And um, uh, to my friends uh, presenting with me today, Nga uh, mihi nui e hoa, and uh, ko Amos Mann, Aho, digital producer at Te Papa Tongariwa. Um, we're here to present a brief glimpse on each of our different perspectives on the creation of digital labels for te taiao nature. Uh, it was a very large and complex production. There are nine digital label kiosks in the exhibition covering over 200 specimens and uh, the labels are rich with media and with storytelling. The exhibition is expected to be open for more than 10 years, which adds another layer of complexity to how we might approach uh, digital labels. Uh, we opened in May this year. We began planning for the digital labels in 2017. Uh, we planned for big concentrations of specimens in the exhibition, and our strategy was to use digital labels to interpret these mass displays. This would help us avoid cluttering the walls with hundreds of uh, print labels and help us uh, provide a media-rich, interactive experience, a uh, choice-based experience for our visitors. Um, the, um, some of the work there. Um, the priority audiences for digital labels was a subset of to Papa's range of visitors. And you may have heard Frith speak more on this uh, in, in detail, which is great. Um, we were focused on, really, on adults and teens who wanted to learn more. With the digital labels, that was our focus. The primary goal for Te Taio Digital Labels was to answer the visitor question, what is that and why is it on display? We were starting with a strong history of digital label production at Te Papa, um, and we'd already invested in the development of the digital experience delivery system named Te Papa Hiko, uh, which enables and supports production of touchscreen interactives uh, within the gallery, including a wonderful interactive map that uh, you will see in uh, another exhibition, um, Tamatea. Uh, in toy art more recently. Um, because of the scale and complexity of this project, we undertook a lot of careful planning, prototyping, and testing. We worked towards a more standardized approach across all the labels. We developed tools and processes to help us work together better. And we needed somebody to be our content manager. Um, and I'd like to make special note of the exceptional con content management work of Jane Harris. Uh, Jane was not able to be with us today, but to give us an idea of the number of people involved and the centrality of her role as content manager, uh, Jane put together this list showing all the people and teams that she collaborated with throughout the project. Now, let's proceed on our journey through different perspectives on digital label production. And to help us find our way, we've drafted a rough map. Um, in some ways, this journey can be seen to start with uh, concept development, tied closely to object selection, curatorial direction, and uh, case layout design. These activities feed in to agreement and design of the digital label content structures, which you can see just at the bottom there, or in the middle there. <laughs> and now let's talk about the next step, UX design. Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, ko Mike Haim toko ingawa, ko te kaihohoa aho. I'm Mike Haim, I'm from a company called Octave. Um, and I'm the UX UI designer on this project. Um, I formerly was actually the UX design lead here at Papa, so have some experience of digital labels um, beyond this. Also, a huge shout out to my colleague Pat Horsley, who was the senior developer from Octave, who built all of these labels. So I'm gonna focus on one key aspect of the um, design, 
um, and that is there is so much great content, too much great content to share. This is a video of a kiwi hatching. It's a lovely, deliciously short 30 second video of a kiwi hatching out of an egg. I showed my preschool daughters, they loved it, I loved it, everyone should see it. But there's so much of this content like that, and so a key challenge for me as the UX designer, UX UI designer, is how might we make it effortless for visitors to view lots of great content, educational, inspirational, informative content, that they don't even know that they would enjoy, they don't even know that it exists. There's so much to share, but they don't know what, what's there, and it's our job to make it effortless for them to experience it. So we, we took some cues from social media, and you might think, oh, gross, social media, I know, but naff. But in a way, social media is a way that we experience lots of content that we're not looking for. We're just trawling, we're window shopping for things that pique our interest. And they've done an excellent job of creating interfaces that help share that kind of content. So we took some cues. So one, one, thing that, one way we did that was prioritizing scrolling over clicks. And so this is an example of an, uh, an article about the bottlenose dolphin um, skull. And this is an exploded view where you can see that we've put all this content down the page and the, the, the key interaction is to scroll through it because scrolling is a continuation, whereas clicking is a, is a decision that people have to make. So if we can remove a decision and just let people scroll, it's far easier. An emphasis on visual content goes without saying. One thing we did is that we kept the sidebar um, always available so if other people are looking, they can read the label, whereas the image can slip underneath. Um, and images always take up that full kind of right-hand side otherwise. Um, autoplay video. Videos just start playing when you, you scroll past them. Why not? Why ask people to play? We know they're great. And if people want to tap them to stop them or scroll on, that's fine. And never-ending content. It's not exactly like um, social media, but you'll never get to the bottom of Facebook or Twitter. Always more content is loaded. We took an approach like that by placing one next article at the bottom of every at the bottom of every article, there's a next link. Only one, not a multitude, just one choice to help people continue going through the label if they choose, or they can go back home and make another selection. We had some questions about this though, there were some concerns. Will visitors find this hidden content underneath? Is scrolling on a touch screen on a kiosk, does that feel weird? Is this webby website approach a bit naff for a, you know, a really elegant exhibition? So we had concerns, so what did we do? We did some user testing, I created some prototypes um, in Atomic, that could scroll, could, um, could transition. Amos and I rolled them out on the floor, tested them with real people, and it was all fine. And what we ended up with was what feels like a very fluid, very kind of um, smooth, a whole lot of content that people can move through really quickly that we think is, a um, yeah, we're really proud of. Um, we, and for, for which we won a bronze award at the Best Awards this year, which we're really proud of. And one final screen is, um, part of my job was creating a component suite that allowed the content creators enough control, but controlling them so it still looked really consistent, um, and the sort of content suite that plugs into the CMS. Now let's talk about spatial design. Just the next one. Kira Tato, I'm uh, called Rosie Kwan Aho. I'm one of the 3D exhibition designers here at Te Papa, which means I'm responsible for the spatial layout and design of the exhibition, which can be anything from general visitor flow right down to detailed object layout. In terms of digital labels, that meant making sure that what we presented physically matched what would end up on screen and vice versa. We wanted to to ensure a good relationship between the two so that visitors felt comfortable using the kiosks and making that connection between digital and physical object. Uh, here are the nine digital label kiosk locations. You'll see there's two kiosks for the endemic wall, which was one of the larger, more complex displays, and we anticipated high en higher engagement there. I'll talk a bit more in detail about that one. Um, there were groups within groups and hundreds of objects proposed for this particular display, but there were we were only able to include 50 objects on the digital label for this one. Um, the other ones contained all of them. Uh, we worked out object uh, groupings, and then we pinned an initial selection up onto the wall to see what we were talking about. Uh, there was such a range of specimens from large and obvious to ridiculously tiny. Some were models yet to be made that we didn't even have yet. Um, we decided not to measure up each object individually as we might still be measuring today. What worked best for all of the teams was to create full-size mock-ups um, of the displays, section by section. 
Um, and this is what that often looked like. Um, here's one of the groups showing how we use these mock-ups to share information across the teams. The team identified objects within, with the most significant stories to tell, which would end up on the digital labels, and we took these into consideration when designing these layouts. Not only were we looking at a visual balance overall, but we were also thinking about where those story objects were located so that we didn't end up with them all huddled down in one corner. Ah. This shows where the marine invert this shows the marine inverted section as a physical mock-up, and those pink dots show the story objects. And then this is where they ended up on the digital labels. The smaller objects were enlarged for clarity, but were kept in roughly the same location to maintain their visual association to the display. And this is the whole endemic wall as a digital label. Um, the showcase itself was quite a complex installation. Here's the marine invertebrate section nearly complete. And the whole wall. And here it is now in the exhibition. You can see where the kiosk ended up for the endemic wall. Um, because this display is so huge, we space the kiosks back away from the wall so the visitor could take in the whole display while using the digital label. And there's also space for others to get right up to the display and view up close at the same time. Um, one of the other reasons for doing digital labels was to let the objects be the heroes and reduce the vis visual clutter of having too many labels. So there we have like a nice clean display and then you can go into further detail in the labels. And now I'll pass the baton on to imaging. Uh, kia ora, uh, ora koutou, uh, my ko Michael O'Neill uh, uh, and I'm here representing the imaging team. Um, there's our little piece of the map there. Uh, you would have seen by Rosie's image there that, um, in fact, on the digital label, there was only 50 specimens represented on the label. We made a call right up front to actually image every single object that went on the floor because there'll be more digital offerings in the future. As we said, the exhibition's on for 10 years. Getting them from, off to photograph is a bit difficult. So um, we photographed over 1,000 specimens, uh, and the, for the three of us involved, uh, it amounted to over a year's work. Um, the first consideration was the scale, the various scale. So uh, here we have a mower, very large, just fitted into the studio. Finished product, nice job by Marty, the photographer there. Uh, and then the very small, so here's a setup for a very small object. Um, it's a uh, macro setup and there's a little uh, aquarium at the bottom for, we put uh, fresh specimens in like this one, so it's floating in ethanol. Uh, and you can see the size of this. This is a glow worm head. This is actually on display. Uh, but all we see is the nest itself, so here you get a lot more intimate into it. Uh, the uh, main uh, use of our photography is to get a primary image. So the primary image is meant to um, be a visual key, as we discussed, between the label and what's on display. So we would photograph in the same orientation as the object would appear uh, on the label. We started with birds, but when we started, the orientation hadn't been decided at that point. So, but we needed to get underway because we knew we had a big job ahead of us. So we photographed the birds in multiple rotations, knowing that by the time the physical selection was made, we would have the correct image. Uh, and the second output is secondary images, uh, which feed the kit A and stories, which you'll hear a bit later on. It's, the, it's the, the next content. That's where we as photographers you know, could get a bit more creative for the images we would do. Uh, but we'd also support uh, a certain story. So sometimes there'd be details about a uh, specimen that that's what was being required to be photographed so that it would uh, support the stories being told, such as the pincers here. Um, Another imaging challenge for us was uh, jars. So the jars are actually shot in uh, a multiple setup. So the jars are lit separately from the specimen themselves because we want to show everything in the best light possible. Uh, and we shoot everything in very high resolution. So uh, as um, Mike already attested to, these zoom capabilities on the digital labels. Uh, all our images are uh, 5,300 pixels wide. In fact, size down for the uh, uh, labels, but it means we can zoom in and see qualities and images, pieces, or see the specimens in this detail, which is actually not physically possible on the floor. So it's added content. 
Uh, and another thing we did was 360 spins. We did eight of these, so we would photograph the specimen 72 times, uh, deliver all these images to Mike, and the, uh, the software itself puts these to image, uh, this together. Now these spins are zoomable and interactive, um, so very cool. All up, as an imaging team, we're really happy with digital labels. It's a great platform for us to display our photography, um, so we want to see more of them. I'm now going to hand over to the writers. are the encounters of people through digital platforms. The star chart, the sextant, represent uh, two independent navigational systems, technologies that guide the two cultures to one destination, Aotearoa, New Zealand. Tēnā koutou korane āperahama, tōku ingoa a mātou tēnei, for Francis Samuel, for Victoria Cleo, we are here on behalf of the writing team. We manage 50-50 concise bicultural narratives that enhance and embody awareness experience. It's like the building of a digital waka with physical limits while navigating through tight deadlines and unforeseen challenges and exciting exploration. We are stonemasons of concept of words laying two world view foundations of equal value to advance the building of one house of inspiration that serves and embraces the well-being of nature and humanity. I now present to you Francis Samuel. Kia ora rania. Um, our work as writers was to take a lot of complex information, decide on what stories to tell the visitor, and then tell those in an engaging, accurate way. Uh, digital gave us the opportunity to tell a range of stories for each specimen through different media. Uh, this is the display of whale and dolphin skulls um, with a taonga at the top, which the digital labels brought to life. And here's the screen for the dusky dolphin. The visitor can scroll down for additional stories called Kete. Uh, where did the information uh, for the stories come from? We worked with both Te Papa and external scientists and um, experts, media researchers, and a Mātauranga Māori expert, Brad Hami. Could we say everything we wanted? Um, sometimes a challenge. We had about 60 words and limited media for an optimal visitor experience. A couple of things to notice here are the tone of the writing. Um, it's conversational, everyday language with a bit of humour, um, but we didn't shy away from stories that were sad or unsettling. Um, you'll also notice circles around selected words. Um, tap, and you'll hear the words spoken and translated, like so. Whore, friend. <laughs> Uh, one of Titaio's aims was to encourage uh, te reo learning. So every label is bilingual, um, and as Rania said, they're not a straight translation, but they tell the story from a te ao Māori worldview. Thanks. I'll hand over to Victoria now to talk about the Kiti stories. The kete range from the whakapapa of species to behind the scenes meet the scientists stories. We decided on the best way to tell each kete story through video, audio, photos, GIFs or even artworks. Um, we wanted to engage visitors senses, sight, sound, touch. This first kete is about a dolphin who guided the explorer Kupe. Uh, we knew that not all visitors would scroll through all the kete, so we had to apply a hierarchy. A key message in the whales and dolphins display case is the strong connection between Māori and whales and dolphins. So we wanted to put that message up front in the kete. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> 
As part of bringing the specimen to life, we absolutely had to have a heartwarming video of frolicking dusky dolphins. Next, there's an audio clip. Dolphin sounds are well known and loved. <laughs> this echolocation GIF has less wow factor, so it's a bit lower down, but it's still an important part of the story and it's useful for education groups. This image connects with visitors who might have been whale watching and also with the economic importance of tourism in Aotearoa. Finally, there's a map. Not a crowd pleaser, but very helpful if you want to dig deep. Eh, hey, Rania? Ah, tika koe. Ah, kia ke panuku, kia ke tangaroa. Home ye, hui ye. Tai ki ye. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to give you back to Amos, us, to Amos man. Kia ora tato. So now let's talk about content management. And um, I'd like, again, to uh, stress the importance of the work of Jane Harris and her management of digital label content, um, no matter how many tools and processes we would have put in place, um, we wouldn't have been able to do it without her. Um, you can see here um, these roles include our ownership of the agreed content structure, ownership of the content production tracking tools, ownership of the CMS and input of content to the CMS, management and tracking of the proofing process and inputting proofing changes back into the CMS. Uh, so a big thanks to Jane Harris. Uh, she makes us look good. <laughs> um, Here's a snapshot of the Google Sheet that Jane set up for us to use across a number of different teams. Uh, it was most useful in coordinating workflow towards Im the imaging of specimens um, as the specimens went through curatorial, collection managers, mount makers, and conservation before being ready for imaging. So all of those teams were editing cells within the Google Sheet live, hour to hour. And we were, we were also setting up notification on specific cells so that when somebody changed the status of that cell, uh, an email would be sent directly to the imaging team. Ah, that's ready for imaging now. And so the sheet became useful beyond work that was specific for the digital labels. It became this uh, really... Um, uh, high quality and uh, up-to-date source of information for all of those teams. We adopted a headless CMS for the to tie our digital labels. The CMS is only loosely coupled to the digital label um, and uh, to Papaheko application build process, uh, rather than driving the content in a more direct way, as you might find uh, when uh, uh, managing a website. On previous digital label projects, we had to uh, hard code content into the JSON files, um, which would have been very difficult for Tataiao due to the uh, vast amounts of content. Uh, and now let's talk about the development and build processes. So hello, my name is Daniel Nash. Um, I'm front-end developer on the creative development team here at Tapapa, um, mostly working on digital labels. Uh, usually that's a matter of taking the input and uh, synthesizing something 100% correct, reliable, functional and amazing on the first release. Uh, but does it matter if we don't have the content until Friday? <laughs> so previously we'd worked on uh, developing the Deeds platform and the Papahiko framework. Uh, which had helped us deliver earlier products. Um, so that was the component kit and a deployer coupled with a player for React-based interactives, basically uh, utilizing web platforms and analytics installed locally onto the box. But Tapava didn't have enough developers to work on the production pipeline and develop the labels for this exhibition. I'm the developer. Uh, we started working on the pipelines and we outsourced the label design and development to the team at Octave. So 
I'd like to acknowledge the tremendous work of their talented developer, Pat Horsley, who took our limited to Papahiko builder kit of mostly functional components, examples, tools, scripts, code, and style guides. And after making it past an acceptance test and many hours of Amos's user testing, delivered us version one of the labels and the templated system for building them. Now, if you've used them, I think you'll agree he and Mike helped us achieve some beautiful, rich, and seamless experiences. Another key tool that uh, we needed to identify and build was uh, a layout updating tool for uh, the label's homepage. And here you can see me editing something in Sketch at the top left, and there's an interactive at the bottom right updating. With dozens of items being displayed or maybe rearranged and dynamically zoomed on their on-screen locations, it was critical for matching the displays to give a highly usable and seamless user experience. Oh, sorry. Meanwhile, here we had refined the deed system. It was used to package, deploy, and monitor the 10 label instances on the floor. Credit here needs to go to my team leader, Rhinus Patel, who with uh, help from Springload and our award-winning AV tech, Andy Ellison, made that process routine. And it really needed to be because we had over 3,000 builds in the month before we went live. For this exhibition, opening day was just the beginning of the life of the work. Um, Pat had delivered us a system for getting the thing on the floor, but we still were working on finalizing the other 50% of the content and uh, refining the build pipelines after that. For instance, images photographed in glorious detail by Mike O'Neill were then chopped into tiny pieces, squished and jigsawed by our build process because that's how the browser needs them. We found that we still have work to do to control that process so that end-to-end -end images can be selected, put back together in the interactive and have their formats changed and their color profiles preserved whilst managing processing tool dependencies, versioning, and long-term archiving of the right derivatives. We can then repeat the process, possibly years from now, on probably obsolete software, but we enjoy a challenge. Uh, I'll now hand back to Amos to talk about uh, audience engagement. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, yeah, so now uh, visitors are, right now, visitors are engaging uh, with, digital with the digital labels in Tatayao. And understanding visitor engagement and audience impact is really important. It's important for reporting on value. How do we know that we are uh, creating value? for our visitors. Um, it's important when considering improvements, including potential future expansion of the endemic digital label to include all 700 specimens uh, in the cases. Um, and thanks to uh, Mike for the foresight um, and photographing, uh, insisting to photograph all 700 up front. That should be easy. <laughs> and, um, and then thirdly, um, we need to understand audience impact and visitor engagement so we can do even better next time. Continuous improvement. We've just started uh, research on engagement with Tataio digital labels, but through observational research, we can already see that um, the labels are engaging experiences. They are engaging experiences. And we can also see that they are social experiences. They are, they are social experiences. Um, but we are just beginning this observational research and uh, uh, more to come. We also have uh, analytics coming live from the digital labels uh, from the floor. And when we combine this with the observational research, we can uh, gain a uh, much greater, more um, full understanding. And now, for what you've all been waiting for, who's winning? <laughs> Uh, endemic is getting the most hits on specimens, but keep in mind there are two kiosks for endemic, which probably has an influence on those numbers. If so, then these numbers could speak to capacity limits for the kiosks during busy periods, maybe. Um, also, each kiosk has a different number of specimens to choose from. For example, Endemic has 50, while Wales has just 14, and Kiwi has only nine. Factoring the number of choices 
could be an important approach to learn more about engagement and visitor preferences and choices and behaviour. Here's another view, looking at top engagement with specimens across all the digital labels, uh, mirroring Kelly's uh, analysis. Um, interestingly, the top 10 specimens on whales are for whales, kiwi, bugs, and moa kiosks, which also happen to be the first four kiosks visitors encounter as they walk through the exhibition, also mirroring uh, Kelly's findings. So in conclusion, more research needed. <laughs> um, however, although it's still uh, very early, um, we can start to form a hypothesis from some of our findings. We might be starting to see three distinct groups of users. And I just happen to have this open on my desk as one of our um, uh, scientists uh, walked by and they looked at me like, oh, if you squint, you can see three groups. So I was like, oh, you can actually. <laughs> And so maybe what we're seeing are deep divers who are engaging for between two and a half minutes and up to 12 minutes. We might be also seeing a group of browsers who are engaging for about one to two minutes. And we, are, we can see also those who just want a quick answer to that question, what is that and why is it on display? And hopefully, we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you very much. We are into lunch, um, but if you, uh, anyone who wants to leave, feel free. Uh, but anyone who does have any questions, please put a hand up. We'll bring a roving mic. Should be on, I think. Check. Yes, it's on. Hello, everyone. Excellent work. Um, love it. Given that you've got so much wonderful, uh, rich content and fabulous stories, have you been tempted to put all of that content on the web? Yes. <laughs> and have you done that? Um, we, had, we, uh, we put together a bit of a pitch for um, reusing another system that we built on the Deeds platform, which is, uh, 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 which is um, a sort of, uh, it's almost like Instagram scrolling. and. Um, uh, uh, Instagram scrolling site, basically, is, is maybe what you might call it, sort of. And uh, we we thought actually we could we we could actually um, take use this headless CMS and feed that, and um, and there and th there we'd we'd have uh, in gallery op opportunity for people to browse on their own devices as well as uh, anywhere. Um, Within the exhibition structures, um, sometimes that's a bit tricky to resource, and so we kind of kept that in mind. It's still there. We can do it. Um, it's just about getting it into the business plan. Tops, thank you. I'll just add to that as um, strategic owner of the websites. The, obviously, the exhibition context, context is very different, and just trans moving them and transferring them doesn't always work. But what we are doing is the image is uh, uh, what we can push through to be na and now available on collections online, where there are specimens and those sorts of things. So obviously, the imaging is multi-purpose. We are also thinking about what context we can shift some of these key facts through onto the general web that don't rely on the rest of the um, the exhibition experience, so that when we haven't um, only got the content on the floor. That's the business. <laughs> uh, kia ora. Um, thank you for a really, really fascinating presentation. That was awesome. Um, that was my first question, so I get to go to my second question, which is great. Um, particularly around the pipeline, um, the, the, the technical side of the production of the, of the labels, what, what are the odds that's going to be open source or available for other people to kind of get involved with? Do you want me to speak to that? Think of it, both Auckland Museum and you guys yeah. should answer the open source question. Um, Adrian, uh, do you want to answer that? I mean, it's it's something that that um, we have explored, and I think um, I I, uh, I I haven't been involved in that discussion. There's lots of discussions. Um, <laughs> So the, a goal, one way we talked about it before is not necessarily open source, but definitely wanting it to be reused by other people in the future. So it might be that open source uh, internally is not something that we can immediately go to with such a uh, complex 
piece of infrastructure, um, but our goal is definitely to make it reusable. So we have, for example, we did um, share with Auckland Museum, um, and we even paid for Springload to go and um, give some advice and things like that, because we want it to be out there. So there are a number of barriers in the way that um, the exhibition delivery had to be the priority. Um, we may have some time now to start thinking about what the future looks like, not only for the use of it in our new redeveloped galleries up on level four, which will be happening in the next few years, but also how we can spread it out a bit further. Do you want to say anything? Um, same with Auckland Museum, however the complexity with our development is that it's built into the Kentico content management system, so it's within that platform which is not an open source platform, so um, all of the code that we develop is put into GitHub, and but it's not necessarily something that developers can actually continue to develop and enhance on, so we definitely need to look at that. And lastly, sort of keeping in mind some assembly required, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is actually a question for you, Kel, while you're, while you're there. Um, I just noticed with your labels, while they, um, the digital labels, while they had more content than just the printed labels, there wasn't particularly much more. Is, was that a conscious decision or just a lack of time and resources to write more content or tell me about that? That was please. all driven by the curatorial team and so obviously that's the challenge where you have this platform and the opportunity to put lots of content on but actually there's still that piece where visitors will only um, spend a short period of time and how much content do you provide without it being overwhelming? So um, it's still something that we need to develop and actually some of these labels don't have that extended object label and that was a bit of a contentious conversation around um, different parts of the museum. Um, so as a platform moving forward, that collaboration across teams is really, really important and it's awesome to see all of you guys here today really showing how that's worked at Te Papa. Um, and that has absolutely happened at Auckland Museum, but kind of, I guess, more behind the scenes. Yeah. Thanks. Anyone else? Not missing anyone I th behind I think any that's, I, just, I just wanted to add to that, that it takes effort. <laughs> Getting that um, collaboration, I mean, and so, again, a big hand to, to everybody for that for um, all those teams sort of uh, coming into the equation with uh, you know, emptying their cup before coming into it and um, really putting ego aside and, and team, team prowess and all of that. And so, well, actually, we can only do this through working together. So, yeah. Cool, so we'll wrap up. Um, thanks to both teams, um, both museums. Um, one last 